thank you. Thank you for being here at 8 o'clock in the morning, especially if you hail from the West Coast, where it is even earlier. Um, so I'm going to be presenting today. I have been, for the past seven years, collaborating with some botanists on um, modeling growth and reproduction in a um, family of plants called bromeliads or bromeliaceae. Um, and so I'm going to present some modeling work. Some of it is stuff that I have done with my collaborators and with students. Uh, others are things from uh, other botanists who have dabbled a little bit in modeling. So before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about the family of bromeliads. So they are perennial plants. Um, some are quite long lived and can live up to 100 years, but not all of them. Some of them, you know, it's only five to 10 years. Um, they can be very, very small. So if, you've, if you have, in this great state of Florida, seen Spanish moss hanging from trees, right? The, um, that is the smallest bromeliad. Uh, the largest you can find down in, uh, at high altitudes in South America is the queen of the Andes, and they can grow up to 15 meters tall. Roughly half of bromeliads are terrestrial, so they, their roots grow in soil, but the other half are epiphytes, which means that their roots are modified and they attach to uh, trees, and so you would find them high up in the canopy. Um, their leaves grow in a rosette pattern, so it's a spiral rosette. Uh, sometimes they're overlapping at the base and they can form a tank that holds water, which provides a whole micro ecosystem for lots of different creatures. Um, and then from each rosette, from the center, grows an inflorescence, which produces the flowers, which allows for sexual reproduction. But there are actually two modes of reproduction in bromeliads. So there's the classic sexual reproduction via pollination of flowers, but you can also get these uh, clonal rosettes, or they're sometimes called clonal ramets or pups. They are genetically identical to the plant that they grow out of, and each of those grows into a rosette that can then produce an inflorescence, um, which can then have sexual reproduction. Um, so when we talk about patterns of growth and reproduction and the relative timing of these things, it's often lumped into uh, what is referred to as life history. So the life history strategy of a plant or any species refers to the, the timing of reproduction and growth. Um, so I'm going to call out two different um, methods that uh, I'll refer back to them at various points in this talk. So there's Semmelparis. So there are a small selection of species of bromeliads which do not have the ability to produce these clonal ramets. And so they have one shot at sexual reproduction. There is the one rosette, and that is its one shot. So you can think of this as like the salmon strategy. Uh, but most of them do produce these clonal ramets, and so they have multiple iterative opportunities for sexual reproduction. And this is called the iteroparis life history strategy. So semilparis, one shot, iteroparis, many, many opportunities. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the models. So we're going to start with just some like very basic, simple models and sort of ramp up to more complicated models. So the first set of models that I want to talk about, and these are just built with continuous functions, are models that simulate allometric relationships. So uh, allometry is just describing the relationship of how different body traits scale with one another. So the example that I have here is the size of the rosette and how that scales with how many flowers you see on the inflorescence. Um, so there's two examples here. So one is this Pusia dasliroides, and the other is Talansia utriculata, which is native to the state of Florida. Uh, so for the Puya, the size of the rosette is measured as the radius of the rosette. And then uh, we uh, have the number of flowers. And so this is a scatter plot of the radius on the horizontal axis and the number of flowers on the vertical axis. And we can fit an exponential model to uh, describe how increase in radius 
corresponds to increase in uh, number of flowers. Uh, for the Tillandsia, the size of the rosette is measured in terms of the longest leaf length, which is abbreviated here and on other slides as LLL. So the length of the longest leaf of the rosette. Uh, so the horizontal axis is longest leaf length, and then the vertical axis is it's capsules, but it means flowers. Uh, and that uses a power function, right? So simple functions that could be used in like a calculus class uh, if you're looking for interesting examples of things that are not just changing over time. Uh, these would be uh, some good examples. And uh, the, the data for the Tillandsia utriculata was collected by students and they were able to, to do uh, this fitting as part of a research project. All right. The next example I want to show is actually a multivariable function. So one of the things that my botanist colleagues are really interested in is something called reproductive effort. So what proportion of the plant's resources are devoted towards reproduction? And one measure that we have of this is looking at the proportion of the mass of the plant that is reproductive bits, so the, the inflorescence and all the, the pieces on the inflorescence and the seeds that are produced. Uh, so what proportion of the total mass is that reproductive? So the function that we have here, you have R for reproductive mass, you have V for vegetative mass, and this is just a function of the proportion of mass. Uh, so the graph that I'm showing over here is a contour plot. So there's vegetative mass on the horizontal axis and reproductive mass on the vertical axis. And then the lines here are the contours. And then the uh, different points are actual values for plants that were measured. Uh, so this is a set of uh, greenhouse plants that were grown in Colorado College Greenhouse. Uh, one of my collaborators. So three different species, and we're able to make comparisons of what we see uh, as trends in reproductive effort between different species. So we're able to make comparisons between uh, the species. So these three species are each iteroparous, and we are currently working on collecting data for a semilparous species to see if um, it lies uh, uh, somewhere else in this contour plot. And the prediction is that it will have a higher reproductive effort. So these reproductive effort contours, this is the uh, 0.05, and then this last dotted line here is the uh, 0.55. So the hypothesis is that it'll be um, generally higher for semel pairs. All right. So I want to move to a temporal model of growth. So modeling how the body of the plant grows over time. So this model in particular is going to model how the length of the longest leaf of a rosette increases over time. And this is a discrete time model. So we're using a discrete difference equation up here. So the subscripts uh, represent even increments of time. Uh, and you can think of this as being kind of analogous to the uh, continuous logistic model. So the beverton holt model has that same sort of S-shaped curve that gets produced. And it also has similar parameters. So it has an intrinsic growth rate, this little r, and it has what you could think of as like a carrying capacity, the capital K, but here it's representing the maximum longest leaf length that you're going to get. Um, and if we collect time series data for how these plants are growing over time, we can actually fit um, uh, this model and we can get estimates for the value of R and the value of K for a variety of different species. And then we can make comparisons. So uh, these first two species here, the Guzmani and the Tillandsia, so this comes from a paper by Cascante Marine, who um, was doing field work in Costa Rica. So these are from some Costa Rican populations. And then these lower three right here, those are the same three species that I was showing on this previous slide. So we also had time series data for them. And the higher the value of R, the higher that intrinsic growth rate, the faster that they're growing, the higher the value of K, the longer their leaves get, the bigger the rosette. And so we can start making comparisons between species. 
All right. So um, more recently, I've been working uh, with uh, some of my students on um, how we actually do these fittings. So there's a fun little math trick that you can do with this beverton holt model. So you can do a transformation and transform the equation into a linear form. Uh, and so you do that by effectively, you're taking the reciprocal of the longest leaf length data. And so if you plot the reciprocal of the longest leaf length data in year T and its corresponding value in the next year, right? So you're plotting reciprocal versus reciprocal. It will appear linear and you can fit a line through it using uh, linear regression. And from there, you can get your estimates for R and K. So I've been working um, with some sophomores actually on doing this for a couple of different species that we have data for. And then we're generating stochastic simulations where we're drawing the values of R and K uh, at every time step from uh, uniform distributions over the 95% confidence interval for these parameter estimates. All right, now I'm going to switch to a different model of growth. So this is a compartmental model of growth. So the previous model of growth is just looking at how the longest leaf length is growing over time. This model is going to look at the total mass of the plant over time, but broken into different compartments. So we're going to tease out the vegetative mass, so the photosynthesizing leaves, from the reproductive mass. And we're going to break the reproductive mass into, you have that sexually reproductive mass, so this is your inflorescence, where the flowers are, and then you also have that um, asexual reproductive mass, so this is any of the pups. Uh, and so we can use, and, and then we um, parse out in time. So at the beginning, there's only reproductive growth. And then there's a time at which now we have pups growing as well. So we have some reproductive growth and some uh, asexual, or sorry, some vegetative growth and some asexual reproductive growth. And then at the end, we have everything. Um, and so we um, used a set of differential equations to model this over time. And I'm not going to share all the results from this, um, but just to show that if we have a model which simulates the mass of the reproductive and the vegetative part, we can calculate the reproductive effort. So we can simulate what the reproductive effort would be, not just at one time point at the end of its life, uh, but over time. So we can see how reproductive effort is changing over time. And we can calculate different types of reproductive effort. So we could calculate the reproductive effort that I showed on the previous slide, um, which assumes that the pup mass, those clonal rosettes, are not included in the reproductive effort calculation. Or we could say, well, we're only going to calculate the proportion of reproductive effort that's sexual reproductive effort. Or we could say we're only going to calculate the proportion that's asexual reproductive effort. Or we could take the sum of these two. And so this graph here is just showing how those different measures of reproductive effort are changing over the lifespan of the initial mother rosette. Um, and then we looked at two different time scales. So the second one assumes that there's much more time between um, this T sub A and this T sub S. So the time before the inflorescence starts to be produced. All right. So now I want to switch gears once again. So we've been talking about individual rosettes and growth of individual rosettes. But let's scale it up even further and talk about populations. So if we want to model how an entire population of bromeliads, of a specific species, is changing over time. One way that we can do this is we can create a demographic model. Um, and one mechanism that we have for that is matrix population models. So we divide the population into different demographic classes. The demographic classes can be based off of whether 
uh, the rosette started as a seed or started as a clone. It can be based off of the size of the rosette. It can be based off of whether it's flowering or not flowering. So these green uh, boxes right here, these represent different size classes of rosettes that were all started from seed. Only the largest are producing inflorescences. So that's this purple box here. Um, and both the medium and the large can produce clones. So, and the cl so one thing that's really interesting about bromeliads is that the clonal rosettes grow much, much faster than ones that are started from seed. Um, so they don't go through all of these size classes. They grow very quickly uh, and then are in the large size class and then can produce their own clones. And then they themselves can uh, produce inflorescences, which then produce seeds, which become seedlings. All right, so we can create these models. Uh, and then one of the things that we have been interested in is looking in particular at endangered populations and using these models to make predictions about population viability. So we have some data about how these plants are growing um, and moving from one size class to the next, how often they, um, or how quickly they uh, produce their inflorescences, how many clones they produce over their lifetime. We use all that information to parameterize the model and then we can calculate um, a metric of population viability. And this is the dominant eigenvalue of the matrix from the matrix model. And it represents the long-term growth rate of the population. So what I have here circled here is when it's greater than one, when that dominant eigenvalue is greater than one, that's an indication that we have population growth over the long term. Population is growing. If it's less than one, the population is going to decline to extinction. And so we can um, do uncertainty analysis and look at lots of different um, uh, parameter sets where we uh, vary over known ranges and we can estimate um, the conditions under which we get population viability. Uh, and then more recently, I don't uh, quite have stuff to show for this, but I've been working with students on also layering in conservation strategies. So we've been looking at seed banking strategies uh, and using optimal control theory layered on top of um, the matrix model to uh, get optimal uh, seed banking strategies and estimating whether that leads to population viability over the long term or not. Okay. So the last model that I want to look at is an agent-based model. So this is also a demographic population model. The difference is we additionally have space, heterogeneous space, explicit in the model. So in an agent-based model, we can have um, our agents, which in this case are going to be our, our rosettes, our individual rosettes. We're tracking them over time and we can keep track of all sorts of individual characteristics. So we can keep track of its size via its longest leaf length. We can keep track of its age, uh, of whether it's flowering or not flowering. So that's this poster pre-induction. Uh, its location, sort of spatially within the landscape, but also this particular species. So this is the Tillandsia utriculata, which is endangered in Florida. Um, and uh, they're epiphytes, so they grow in trees. So we also have to keep track of its height within the canopy. Um, and then one thing that was interesting for this model is we also included the minimum size uh, of induction. So essentially you can think of this as what is the smallest that it could be, or sorry, what is, yeah, the smallest that it could be before it uh, need, uh, can start uh, producing its inflorescence, its flowers. And we considered that to be a heritable trait. Um, from parent to offspring. The other thing to note about this species is the, this particular species does not produce the clonal rosettes, which made this model a little bit simpler, not that this model is simple, um, but uh, we, we don't have to consider uh, the, the clones. And then we specifically modeled the canopy as well, the canopy of the forest. Um, so some of the interesting results that we had. So we varied a lot of the uh, parameters. Um, 
But I want to show you, so we have 10 parameter sets here. Agent-based models are typically stochastic, and so you have to run many iterations of them to see sort of in general what's happening with a given parameter set. So these are just 10 different exemplar parameter sets, and the vertical axis is showing the final population size over those 100 simulations for each parameter set. And um, the line here is showing the initial population size. And this particular uh, population in Florida has been decimated due to weevil infestations. And so we looked at simulations with no weevil present, and then we looked at simulations with the weevil present. And you can see that the difference is, though there are some simulations, some conditions, some parameter sets, where on average the population is ending up below the initial population size. That is almost always the case when the weevil is present. There was only one parameter set where that was not the case. All right, I had one other set of results, but uh, we are out of time. I just want to say uh, thank you for coming. If you are interested in these slides uh, or any of these references, all of these references are clickable links, and you can get the slides uh, by scanning the QR code um, that is up here. Thank you for coming, um, and I think we have some time to take any questions. Mm -hmm. What was the scale of the grid on the Y9 previously? That is an ex I, th I do not remember off the top of my head, um, but I, I could look it up and let you know. Um, it, so it was focusing on one particular area in Sarasota, Mayaka River State Park, and uh, we had a lot of data specifically of the population in that forest. Yeah, I, it wasn't quite one meter by one meter, but it, it, it was on, on that scale. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing as part of my postdoc um, involved getting a feel of um, what we need in order to accurately model uh, dynamics that experimentalists are seeing within the mouse colon. Um, but I'm somebody who wears a lot of different hats. And one of the things that I do besides research is uh, a lot of diversity work, um, particularly with the American Physical Society. Uh, so one thing I wanted to draw a little attention to at the beginning of my talk here is um, kind of the issues that have been coming up about a lot of different conferences um, and the idea of it's a privilege to be able to be at a conference and go to a conference for a lot of different reasons, such as uh, the funding that is required, um, you know, if you have children, the sort of lack of childcare, um, or if you have a disability, sort of lack of access to proper services. Um, in Florida here, there's some added issues that you might be aware of. Uh, this isn't listing everything, but here are just a few, including uh, homophobia and transphobic laws. Um, persecution of undocumented people uh, and discrimination in gender-based health care. Uh, I bring this up because my identity is queer. Um, I'm straight passing because I am married to a man and I look like a woman and I also have a chronic illness. The chronic illness is actually why I had to cancel my talk at MathFest last year. Um, and, you know, I wrote this out before this morning, which was, I don't feel completely safe here, but even as of this morning, I was harassed in the Starbucks, so I think it's very important to kind of bring this up today. So, uh, a few things I wanted to mention is just, um, you know, this is a fully in-person conference, and we spent a few years doing virtual and hybrid conferences, um, so we know at this point how to do them. Uh, so, this is something that could have been done here to make sure the conference was accessible. Uh, there are other things that MAA says that it's doing, such as partnering with Social Offset, um, which I don't know if you know what that is. I looked up a little bit more about it and asked a few questions. 
um, but it seems like it wasn't really aver like advertised very well, but it's a way to uh, donate to some local organizations. Um, specifically, I think there's uh, organizations about LGBT people in Florida, um, but also uh, from my understanding and the questions that I've got answered from MathFest organizers is that MAA hasn't donated themselves, it's for us to donate. Um, and uh, so take a look at that, I guess, after the, the conference itself. Um, there have been other people that have uh, addressed these sort of concerns. I recommend reading this open letter that was posted um, less than a month ago. They also go through some of the issues with what MAA did not respond to. Um, so please take a look at that. I'm not going to go through all of that. I just really want to draw your attention and what you can do um, in general to make our society feel safer for everybody. Um, so one is, you know, know what sort of work is going on out there, um, push for organizations to provide things such as online participation, um, educate yourself, um, being self-designated as an ally is not enough, uh, but also help educate others, um, and then check in with those that are marginalized, uh, see what else that you could do. So with that, I'm going to now jump into my research. Um, so here is my outline. We're going to talk about um, the background of the colon, why this is an interesting project, uh, the experimental data from the group that we are working with at the Mayo Clinic, um, what the model that uh, has already existed um, fails to capture. Um, this work right now is a proposed uh, grant that we are in the process of finding out if we got funded, but it looks promising, so it's a long-term goal. Some of this is very preliminary work, um, and then I'll show you the simulations that we have so far and uh, conclusions. So there's, um, well, we all have colons, uh, I hope, um, and right now I have a video of a colon from a mouse, or two colons from a mouse, and one thing I want to point out here is I'm going to talk about the proximal side of the colon, um, which is the side that's closer to your mouth, uh, and the distal side, which is closer to uh, your anus. I'll, I'll just use that word once. Or we'll say oral or aboral for the rest of this talk. And there's um, a certain type of dynamic that's seen that's really important for uh, our bodily health, and this is typically called a colon migrating motor complex, CMMC. And these are uh, contractions that correlate with effective propulsion of fecal matter through the colon. Um, but there's also seen these um, other sort of dynamics, which are these smaller, uh, they call slow waves, that are uh, seen from the ICCs, or the interstitial cells of Cajal. Um, and they um, work in opposite directions. So what I'm going to point out once the video kind of restarts, but you'll see a much bigger contraction, here you go, that's going, traveling through the length of the colon, and the idea is that's pushing fecal matter. What you can't see in this uh, zoomed out image are those ICC slow waves, um, but if we look at the calcium waves uh, under an objective microscope, you can see those waves traveling in the opposite direction, and then what you see is this big contraction, um, which is this flash right here, and what's happening during that time is a little hard to understand, but we're going to go into this in a lot more depth in a moment. Um, so the cell, I mean, so the colon has three different types of cells that we're interested in uh, using for our model, smooth muscle cells, um, the myenteric neurons, and these ICC cells. Okay, um, I think I've talked kind of enough about these things, but again, that there are two different motor patterns that we're interested in, um, and one thing that we know for sure is that for the CMMCs, this requires activity from the neurons. Okay, so um, the current model 
is based off of the distal end of the colon, and the distal end of the colon has a lot of differences, biologically speaking, than the proximal end. Uh, just the number of different cells that are there and how they're connected. Um, so we'll, so that's one of the reasons why it doesn't really um, show us what we need to know about the proximal side. Uh, but we know that we have these intrinsic primary afferent neurons called IPANs. I'm going to be using IPANs a few times in this talk, um, which is activated by the sort of stretching that occurs from the fecal matter inside of the colon. Uh, then what happens is that the ascending pathway ends up uh, opening up and the descending pathway, uh, well, I think I switched those in my brain, but um, the oral end ends up contracting and the, uh, um, the aboral end ends up opening up to help push along that fecal matter. Um, and then when the pellet moves forward, it activates the eye pans in the next you know, section of the colon. Um, okay, so these, um, so we're interested in what's called spontaneous, um, and we've changed the name slightly to just be um, colonic motor complexes instead of migrating motor complexes, because we're talking about just what's going on in the proximal end right now, and that's what the rest of the talk's going to be about, just the proximal end. So what's interesting about these is that um, there's no fecal matter present at that moment, um, but these CMCs recur occur very regularly. Um, and as I said, there's no fecal matter, a pellet hasn't formed, so there's no sort of stretching that is felt necessarily, and it's unclear why the CMCs end up occurring. Um, but we do notice that we still have a similar sort of pattern with the ICCs, which propagate these small uh, ripples from the aboral end to the oral. Um, and what's noticed from our experimentalists is that if we measure the uh, dynamics of the ICCs um, before the CMC has occurred, they look very regular and synchronized. Um, and if we measure them after, they are very dis disorganized. Okay. Let me just put those up. Okay, so this is showing what I just said there, where we have this heat plot um, where we're seeing uh, this light blue here is um, the ICC wave activating, um, and it's traveling from the aboral end. I think my red arrows are wrong. Sorry about that. But it's traveling from the aboral end to the oral end, um, and we see how regular this looks like for different regions of interest along the, the colon. And then we see where the CMC occurs, um, and then afterwards, uh, for this example, it doesn't get too disordered, but it looks like it's a little bit disordered until it gets uh, reorganized. Um, so one thing that ends up happening during uh, these CMCs is that uh, the, the muscle itself uh, ends up being displaced quite a bit. And because of that, it's really hard to get accurate data about the, C uh, the ICCs during that time. It moves out of the, the frame um, of view. And that's why, um, you, I mean, when we also saw the calcium signal, we saw just a big flash from the calcium. Um, and right now, we're still trying to understand what is going on with the ICCs um, right after. But we can see that in the displacement of the muscle, that there is a large displacement where their CMC occurs. Um, there's some rippling. Uh, and then it appears that the smaller ripples from the slow waves get bigger until there's a much uh, bigger CMC contraction again. So kind of just uh, summarizing this part so far is that the current model based on the distal colon um, doesn't really capture everything. Some significant differences. The, modal, the motor patterns are not spontaneous. There's no fecal contents. Um, and the sort of organization and neurochemical makeup, I said the biology is a little bit different. Um, so we're going to look at um, what we need to do to, see the to capture the dynamics uh, in the, the proximal end. Um, some questions that we had and the goals for this project are, okay, how, how do we understand that sort of uh, rhythmic propulsive contraction? Um, how do the ICC waves that uh, go aborally to orally 
play a part in the spontaneous CMCs. Some models, uh, I didn't show this, but some models, the ICCs are there, but they don't do much. In fact, in, in some of the current accepted models, they're not coupled together, they don't have waves, um, they're just existing, and um, we believe from some other experiments that have been done that they do play an important part in the CMCs. Um, by what we understand about couple oscillator systems, um, what, um, what can we, what sort of questions can we ask and what sort of information can we get about the model that we're building that we may be able to ask our experimentalists so then they can go and actually test them out themselves. So there has been some times of just, hey, does this make sense? We're finding that we get the appropriate dynamic if we couple these two things and then they go off and say, okay, let's see if, what sort of experiments we can do in order to test that. Um, and then the ultimate goal, though, is using the model in a predictive way, uh, specifically for different conditions like Hirschsprung's disease. Okay, so um, as I've mentioned a few times already, is that uh, the standard model has propulsion through uh, distension by the pellet. Um, so this is one of the standard models right now. Um, and what we see, there's a few parts I'm going to just point out. Um, we, we see these different cellular units. Um, and we have the sensory uh, neuron, which is the eye pans that I have mentioned. And then we have these different interneurons that um, will contract one end and relax the other end. So we still want that sort of contraction and relaxation um, that uh, we see in the distal end. Um, but like I said before, the ICCs play no major role other than kind of providing tone to the muscle itself. Uh, the ICCs here um, aren't coupled to each other. There's no waves that are shown. It's just something that's coupled to the circular muscle. So we have a proposed long-term model. We're not quite there yet. You could see all the different parts. Um, and this is kind of the uh, progression of what we think is happening. Um, we have two different layers of muscle. Um, I'm not going to go into all these parts because it's not going to affect our model today, but uh, what we really care about right now are the ICCSM, um, the slow waves that are organized uh, in the circular muscle and um, the neurons here, but we're going to ignore the longitudinal muscle for now. So um, we had two versions of this model um, ourselves. Actually, this is still, I think, the old model here. So this is the old model that I just showed you. Um, and then what the changes we have made so far to the model is, for now, we have put all of our neurons as one big neuron. We call it the one neuron to rule them all. Um, but obviously, that is not. Um, uh, accurate, so this is one thing we're going to, you know, change in the future. Um, but we have some feedback to the circular muscle, which is the same. We have some feedback from the eye pan neuron itself to the ICCs. Uh, the ICCs themselves are still coupled, are, are now coupled. Um, so those are the major changes here. Um, one of the things that we found ended up being really important in producing this, the correct sort of dynamics um, is looking a little bit closer at the ICCs um, and certain models that exist out there already. Um, and one of the models, which is based on this paper by MTS in 2002, um, has this uh, IP3 dynamics inside their ICC cells, um, and this mediates calcium indu induced calcium release. Um, and this has ways of self-inhibiting um, the ICC dynamics. Um, the important part that we found uh, with this model is this parameter uh, beta. And what beta does is it ends up affecting the frequency of a certain ICC cell in our, in our model. Um, I think I have these on the next slide. So, okay, so, um, so what we have done with that particular beta um, is that if right now we're just doing a 1D chain, which is also not very physical, but um, we're saying we're gonna take some uh, rotational symmetry and just deal with a chain going from the oral to the aboral end. And by just changing beta along that chain, um, and creating this sort of frequency gradient in the ICC, we see that we're able to produce these ICC waves in the correct direction. Um, so here is uh, an example of that in our simulations. 
Um, but one thing that's also interesting about the ICCs is that um, beta can affect other things such as um, the amplitude and we see that there is this um, bifurcation that occurs um, and what we're interested in particular are the, um, the limit cycle um, and how if I move beta higher I end up getting a lower amplitude for my dynamics. Uh, but if I move beta higher, I end up also getting a higher frequency. So at the more aboral end, we'll have a, um, um, a higher beta. So we'll have smaller amplitude in our waves, but we'll have a higher frequency. And then we have this wave that propagates. Okay, so uh, for the neuron part of our model, I mentioned we have one neuron that rules them all. Um, and what we're doing with this right now is we're using the morris lacar model just to uh, play as our, as our neuron. Um, and in particular, what we found that has been really helpful is this uh, slow second messenger in the neuron that is directly affecting the ICC in the, in the particular cell. So it's in, uh, increasing beta or decreasing beta depending on how the neuron is firing. Okay, so um, putting this all together with uh, the uh, muscle, we can see that um, looking at the voltage of our IPAN neuron uh, and the voltage of our ICC, what we can see is that there, there are these small ripples in the muscle until we have this big uh, burst, which is the CMC. Uh, then we have small ripples that build up again, and then we have another big burst. Uh, and this is how it compares with the, what beta is doing in that particular cell based on how it's interacting with the neuron. So um, what we learned from that is that if the ripples are big enough, there seem to be the things that end up triggering the, uh, the CMC. So um, again, more evidence of how um, beta is um, affecting the dynamics of our system, in particular, the time in between our CMC. So our, uh, the time in between our contractions also depends on beta. So it's not just the ICC dynamics, but it's affecting the overall dynamics of the system. So if we have a uh, beta 0.75, a smaller beta here, we can see that the frequency of our CMCs, um, they are more, more frequent. Um, and if we increase beta, then they become less frequent. Okay, so um, putting all of this together, what we end up having is basically a double chain of oscillators where we have um, our high frequency to low frequency ICC wave, uh, but we also see with our CMC, because the beta affects the dynamics of the CMC, we see that a high frequency CMC uh, towards going towards a low frequency CMC. So, um, I'm going to end with some simulations of the full uh, model here. Um, so we see, I'm going to actually start that over so I can explain what you're seeing. So imagine just um, kind of the top of a, you're looking at um, the colon here, the oral end and the aboral end, and it's going to kind of contract kind of like that first video I showed you. Um, so you'll see these small ripples going from, um, right to left, and then you'll see this big contraction that travels down in the other direction. So there's the big contraction. Um, there's some weirdness in our model right now. It's obviously not perfect yet. Um, and if we look at what's going um, through in our space versus time, uh, we can see the uh, CMC wave traveling in the appropriate direction. I'm going to zoom in on this little part here because it's hard to see the ICC dynamics. Um, but if we look at the ICC dynamics uh, before our CMC, we can see that it they are organized and they are going in the right direction. Um, afterwards, they seem to be not quite disorganized, but they, it's hard to see here. Um, I'm going to show you another video where it's a little more obvious of what's going on in the ICC. Uh, so again, um, here we have this blue curve, which is the ICC slow waves. Um, and green, um, you'll see these green dots grow when uh, a CMC is occurring. 
So we see the slow waves going ab orally to orally. Um, it builds, it starts building up. Um, the amplitude ends up growing in our muscle here. Waiting a moment. There we go. So now we see the CMC occurring, but let's also watch what's going on with the ICCs as the CMC is occurring. We see that the wave starts going in both directions and starts colliding in the middle. There's definitely this disorganization that's occurring. Um, so it seems to be doing at least what we want for the most part. Okay, so uh, we've started comparing particular values, uh, making sure speeds are accurate. There's a lot of issues that have been coming up still because like I said, this is a very simplified model and more of a long-term project. Um, I want to just thank um, my advisor and also thank um, our collaborator who just started at the Mayo Clinic um, this past year. Uh, and also, I'm going to leave up some resources from what I talked about earlier. And I believe that's my time. Um, thank you to Anne and Tim for the invitation. Um, this is my first Math Fest, so it's very exciting. Um, I am going into my last year as a Newcomb postdoc at Dartmouth. I'm very excited to be here. I should take out that word, take that word out from the title because it trips everybody up and it doesn't really give you anything, but we'll, <laughs> we'll go through it. Um, so before we start, I just want to say that this work came out of a course that I taught in spring 22 at Dartmouth called Evolutionary Game Theory and Applications. And I had these two really wonderful students, uh, Dan and Zach. And one of the things that I love the most about being at Dartmouth and teaching these classes is meeting these really wonderful students and, uh, and getting to do work with them. Uh, at the beginning of the class, uh, I tell them it's a final project-based class and they come to me at the beginning of the term and they, we do brainstorming sessions and then over the course of the term, we build them into sort of research final projects. Um, and I guess uh, uh, just to, to let you know, most of the work that, all of the work basically that I've done so far before this during my PhD um, was about human dynamics. So looking at opinion formation or the evolution of cooperation. And this was sort of my first foray into the, the world of animals. And that's another thing that I love about, um, about teaching is that I get to learn about all these different kinds of systems through whatever my students are interested in doing at the time. Um, so I just wanted to thank Dan and Zach for, for working on this project during class and then extending it um, through an independent study afterwards. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, something called Arenatoki or Arenatokis parthenogenesis and it is a, a kind of asexual reproduction that follows a haploid diploid um, sex determination system. And so what happens is that unfertilized eggs become haploid male offspring whereas fertilized eggs become diploid female offspring. So it's just about the number of chromosomes. So the females have twice the number of chromosomes that the males do. And this is characteristic of the hymenoptera, which, um, of which bees are a part. Um, and also the, I'm not gonna try to say that, I'll mess it up, but this is the thrips. Um, and so such species, they often exhibit um, very distinct genetic and social dynamics. Um, and it's often characterized by very complex behaviors. Um, for, these, for these little guys, they can do quite a lot. Um, and so the focus of this work and of this talk is going to be on the honeybee. And the honeybee is a really nice system to study uh, because the population is divided into these three distinct castes. So there's, there's the queen bee, is this working? Yeah. The queen bee right here in the center, and then flanking her, there are these worker bees, and then these drone bees as well. And what, the way that Arenatoki works is that it follows this kind of, uh, this haplodiploid sex determination system. And so there is the queen, who's a diploid female, there are drones, which are haploid males, and then there are female diploid workers. And what queens do is they produce eggs and then drones produce sperm. And then if those, uh, if those combine, you can make either 
diploid female workers or another queen who's female, or if they go unfertilize the eggs, then you create these haploid male drones. Um, and basically, uh, you, you'll see here that I put this royal jelly marker here, which is how queens are made. Um, as far as I could see, it's not exactly known how the queen becomes the queen, but what I could gather is that um, early on in life, she eats this royal jelly, um, and this is sort of a really nutrient-rich food that enables her to mature to become the queen, uh, whereas everybody else eats this less nutritious stuff called bee bread. Um, and so these right here, the females, are from fertilized eggs, whereas unfertilized eggs, like I was saying, become uh, haploid male drones. And another thing that I learned about bees as I was doing this is that um, drone bees do not fertilize their own queen's eggs. So in order to uh, prevent things like inbreeding and to increase genetic diversity, uh, there are these things called drone congregation areas. I put a picture of one up here. And they're approximately 300 to 200 meters in diameter, 15 to 30 meters above the ground, although you could see this is already a pretty big range, and it's probably the ranges on these are probably even bigger. Um, and so they're just these, uh, these areas where many uh, drones and queens from different hives come with the express purpose of mating. Um, and it's, it's very complicated and, and not every, people don't really know exactly how they figure out where to go, but it seems like they always know where to go. And so I just put this uh, comic in here um, that you really want to make sure that you go to the right drone congregation area. And these, these uh, queens actually, they know if they're in the right place or not. And um, re experimental work has shown that you know, year after year, season after season, uh, bees from the same hive will go to the same drone congregation areas year after year. And so in the, in the hive, we talked about this a little bit already, but there are the, the queen bee, and then there are the worker bees and the drones. And the queen bee is, she's the leader. She's, she's you know, she's the leader of the hive. Um, she's the largest and most long-lived member of the hive. And she lays eggs. She can lay tons of eggs. Um, and then you have these drones. And their primary pur purpose is to mate with a queen. I say a queen and not the queen, because they're going to be going to these drone congregation areas, or DCAs. Um, and the drone dies shortly after it mates with a queen, and they can constitute anywhere from 1 to 20% of the total population. Um, so most hives have a, one queen, and then the rest is divided into these drones and workers. And there's always these ranges on the numbers of drones and workers because it varies not only from one bee species to the next, but also seasonally. So when it's really cold outside, for example, there's not as much energy in the hive, so the population is much smaller. Whereas in the summer, that's like peak bee time and everybody, everybody's happy, everybody has enough energy. Um, so there's a lot of variability in these things, both seasonally and between uh, bee species. Then you have the workers. They, they surround the queen. They, they sustain the hive. They collect nectar. They collect pollen. They make wax and honeycomb. They provide defense. Um, they could also lay eggs of their own, but these eggs are never fertilized, so they can only create more drones because they don't create eggs that are fertilized. Now, um, I put this uh, image up here from this 2014 paper from um, from these uh, scientists. I think they're from Australia. Um, and basically all you have to get from this is that, um, so circles here are females and squares here are males. The queen has her little um, crown. And what we want to see here is, is basically that because of this, um, uh, the haplodiploid nature uh, of bee reproduction, there's a higher degree of relatedness among female siblings, so that's 70, uh, around 75% um, than with your mother, than, among, uh, than between parents and offspring, which is only um, approximately 50%. And so in theory, this gives uh, workers an incentive to act altruistically because their genes are more effectively propagated through um, the queen's reproduction than their own reproduction. Right? And at the same time, the queen may also want to act altruistically because um, by supporting the drones, 
because nobody's going to be fertilized and her lineage is not going to continue on unless her drones go out and um, are able to survive um, uh, uh, to reproduce and to continue on her lineage. And so this brings us to altruism. Um, probably everybody is, uh, is, is familiar with this, but um, just from an evolutionary perspective, we're going to define altruism as an action that somebody takes um, that helps somebody else at your own um, disadvantage, basically. And so there are different kinds of altruism that we see in nature. So there's cooperative breeding, sharing food and shelter, conspicuous, conspicuous predator alarm calls. So if you know meerkats, um, they, they travel in these like pods and sometimes you know, you'll see them going like this and sometimes they'll make alarm calls and obviously that, that's a, you know, predators will hear that. And so, but they'll do that anyway to protect the people that are you know, standing around them. Um, and then there's this eusociality, which is kind of the, the highest form of this, um, where there could be division of labor into reproductive and non-reproductive ca castes, cooperative care of all the offspring that are in the nest or in the, in the group, um, and overlapping generations of adults. And so bees that we're talking about exhibit both aranatoki as well as eusociality. And so this brings us to what, why does this all matter, right? Why does it matter how much people are related to other people? How does that affect the dynamics and the reproduction within these hives? And so I bring it back to something called Hamilton's rule. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this. But basically what Hamilton's rule says is that you, I better be sufficiently related to you in order to um, do an altruistic act for you. And you can see that right here. Um, in this R is greater than C over B, where R is the coefficient of genetic relatedness, and the B and the C are the benefits and costs, respectively, of doing the altruistic act. And so Hamilton's rule is this, is this nice, compact rule that says that I'm, I'm only going to help you if you're related enough to me. And so this kin selection, this so-called kin selection, um, and how it relates to uh, you know, genetic success, uh, it was really widely accepted in, in the evolutionary biology community for a long time um, that genetic success is re really has to do with measures of relatedness, at least in animal populations. And in humans as well, you can see sort of um, similar things, although relatedness could be much more general for humans um, than just genetic relatedness. Um, and and the, the honeybee was sort of a textbook example of this. It says, hey, look, kin selection, um, that's, that's you know, the gold standard, basically. Um, you have this weird uh, relatedness between siblings and between parents and children, and that's why we see the altruism that we do in bee populations. But then in the 70s, um, this sort of started to fall out of favor a little bit, especially when it came to... Um, uh, termites and other social uh, species like ants that didn't even do, um, that weren't even haplodiploid. And so then there became, um, you know, debates, and this really came to a head around 15 years ago. Um, and there was this huge debate about what the utility of kin selection actually was. And so I just bring this all up to say this is to, 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 um, to, to put ourselves in this. Uh, in this world of, you know, is it kin selection? Is it something else? And I'm, I just did that so we could throw it all out and say that Dan and Zach, um, in their project, they decided to say, OK, well, let's not really make any of those assumptions at all. Let's not really make any kinds of genetic assumptions about how related somebody is to somebody else, to their sister, to their mother, to their children. And let's think of this instead. Let's think of the, the dynamics within a hive as a sort of energy problem. Right? And so we introduce a model that's based on the flow of energy. So first, workers gather energy, and they can keep some of it for themselves, and they can give some, the rest of it over um, to the queen. And in turn, the queen can keep some of, her en some of that energy and otherwise donate the rest of it to the drones. And um, we consider an extended neighborhood of the hive, because remember, we have these um, drone congregation areas, um, and we want to account for 
uh, drones that go to these DCAs to mate with the focal queen. And so we divide this model into um, basically a distribution step and a uh, an expenditure step and a reproduction step. And so basically what you have is that the workers gather energy. There are W amount of workers. Um, they give um, epsilon W of their energy to the queen and then they keep the rest for themselves. The queen gives epsilon Q to the drones, keeps the rest for herself. And then at this expenditure step, everybody has their energy, and you have this UQ, uh, UW, and UD, which is the net, uh, which is the unit cost of reproduction. And then everybody they do their reproduction, and like we saw before, fertilized eggs uh, become workers, right? So if fertilization happens, you get more workers, and if you don't have fertilization, you make more drones. And so that's basically how this reproduction is happening. It's through this energy, um, this energy collection and subsequent expenditure of that energy. And of course, we also have death. So we incorporate a kind of, I would say, a, a loose carrying capacity. Um, and that's, we call that K. And below this carrying capacity, um, one over some lifespan lambda of workers and drones die during each time step. And then above this carrying capacity K, we basically just have um, exponential death, so above that carrying capacity. And here is just, there's a lot of parameters that I already mentioned, so I just wanted to put them back up. And then here in magenta over here, our parameters are, are just values that I haven't mentioned yet. Well, I guess I mentioned the lambda W and the lambda D, which are the, um, the average lifespans. And then JW, JQ, and JD are the energy payoffs at each time step. And then K is the carrying capacity. The U's are the unit costs of reproduction. And then the epsilons are the altruism. And then W and D are the number of workers and drones. And so what we did was we created an, an uh, basically uh, uh, an evolutionary dynamics model of this. And I don't have time to go through all of it, but what we have is reproduction dynamics and death dynamics. And when we take births minus deaths, then we can see what happens to the population over time. So now we're not looking at individuals over time, we're looking at evolving populations depending on fitness, and we're using energy here as a proxy for how fit somebody is. And so you have um, EQ, which is the number of unfertilized eggs produced by the queen, that's how much energy she has in order to create eggs. Same for workers. For drones, it's a little more complicated, right? Because you're limited by a few things. You're limited by the number of drones you have. You can't fertilize more than the number of drones you have. You can't fertilize more than the, the amount of energy you have. And you also can't fertilize more eggs than there are, than the queen has laid. And so you ha that's why we have this min here, because we have to take into account a few more things for the drones. Now, death dynamics, um, all we have here is you're either going to have the standard um, death rate, or if you're above the carrying capacity, um, this exponential uh, when uh, n over k is greater than 1 is just going to give you this exponential death. And so now we do what I said before, which is we just look at the different populations of the workers and drones, um, and we look at uh, the births minus the deaths. So how are they growing over time? How are those populations growing? And for workers, these are differential equations that are just telling us um, the births minus the deaths. It doesn't really matter all these details. I'm just plugging in things from before. We could do something similar for uh, the drones. And this is what we get here. Um, and we have to account here for the fact that drones die um, after they fertilize an egg. And so that's why there's a little bit more complication here. And so what we did, what you normally would do in this case when the, the model is so complicated and, then there's, and there's so many parameters, is we ran simulations. And uh, we, did, we simulated um, the beehive environment over a grid search from epsilon, w, and q from zero, which is total selfishness, to one, which is total altruism. Um, and we, we uh, saved from each of these um, instances the total population size, the ratio of drones to workers, and the time to convergence. Um, and so this is what we saw in terms of total population size. So this is just a snapshot. 
um, here on the left showing how the drones and the worker populations change over time. So this is like a logistic, they, this is what you would expect to see. But what was really interesting um, was this. So this is the final um, population totals for all of the values of epsilon. And what we noticed is that, well, first, the largest beehive was observed when epsilon w equals 1, so that's totally altruistic workers, and a somewhat altruistic queen. Um, although these large population sizes were found for you know, reasonable values of the altruisms of the workers and the queens. And so that's a, a different question is, what is optimal here, right? So biggest is not always optimal in, for bees. It depends on the season, it depends on what's going on in the hive. But the idea was that we were able to find a large range um, of population sizes just from doing the simulation. And the second thing we saw was, you know, we stared at this for a really long time, you know, squinting at the computer and saying, is there some kind of like wedge here, right? I, I'm trying to trace it out with the, um, with the laser here. And so we were wondering, is that just like an artifact? Is it meaningful? What does it do? And so then we decided to look at the drone to worker ratio instead. And these are on log plots just to highlight um, this area. And we indeed saw that there is this wedge here. And if you remember, drones are 1 to 20, uh, no, workers are 1 to 20% of the population of a beehive, and those all fall within this wedge up here. And this was also times to convergence, and we saw that there is this, that it was slowest at this boundary down here. So not only do we have this wedge-shaped boundary here, we also had this boundary, and we wanted to understand that better. And so what we did was we returned to the equations that we wrote originally, and we looked at what is the most complicated part of that equation that we had. And it was this um, ED, which was this uh, minimum between all of these. And so we decided, let's look, you know, let's look at each of these um, limiting factors and see what happens when we take each of them into account step by step. And I don't have time to go through all of the, the details of the calculation that we did, but what we were, what I do want to show you is that by solving, by, by considering each of these limiting factors one step at a time, one layer at a time, we were able to better understand what was actually happening in this um, heat map. And so if we looked at this, uh, this JD over UD and this EQ, we were able to separate this into um, uh, the populations limited by drone energy on the left and the queen's energy on the right. And then if we further looked at the carrying capacity um, limiting factor, we were able to um, separate the, this A and B region from this non-viable, as we called it, C and D region where you just didn't have growth. And then adding to that, if we then looked at um, energy limitation, we were able to separate the boundary between um, drone limited regions, which are this E and F, and energy limited regions, A and B. And so this is what we have um, there. We solved basically everything that we were able to. And this is um, our, analytical, uh, our analytical expression for the population size. And so I think that I'm basically out of time, but what we wanted to see here was we wanted to throw away all of the, um, the assumptions of relatedness and all this kin selection stuff and just see if we thought about this as an energy problem, what would we see? And so just from this um, sort of simple evolutionary dynamics model, we were able to see that there is this kind of delicate balance between the altruism of a queen and an altruism of the, um, uh, the workers. And so the workers, they collect energy, and so they have to give some of it um, on to the queen so that, they could, so that the queen can reproduce. And the queen, in turn, also has to act somewhat altruistically in order for her eggs to be fertilized. And there are these trade-offs also that we saw through, this, through the drone reproduction that we incorporated. Um, and the last thing is that the, you could see that the workers and the queens shouldn't both be excessively altruistic at the same time. Right, because that's just not going to be good for the hive overall. And so we, it was really interesting to see you know, all of these trade-offs come out and all of this, you know, this cool, I never expected to see a, a heat map that looked like this just from these equations. And so that was very cool. Um, and so that's all I have. Um, 
thank you for coming and for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. It's uh, um, workers kind of as long as they're gathering energy, it seems like um, I think it has to do partly with the population totals that there's enough workers kind of to go around because all of the workers are gathering energy, um, and there's just one queen, and so it seems like as long as it also has to do with the death dynamics. How how quickly are the workers being um, replaced once they die with new workers. And so it seems like the, there's, the population balance is such that they can afford kind of to be altruistic um, even at, at the limit of you know, maximum altruism. But that's, that's a good question. That's something I would love to ask like a, a bee expert what they thought of um, because I'm definitely not one. But yeah, that's, I think it has to do with this balance between um, uh, the, the birth and death dynamics and the fact that there are sufficiently many workers in order to make that happen for the hive, at least in this parameter region. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, so far, we've only been thinking about bees. That's kind of, I, it's funny, like the, Dan and Zach, they, they came to me in the beginning of the semester and they were just like, we want to study bees. <laughs> they just really loved bees for some reason. And so, you know, I, I went along with that. But of course, there are other kinds of um, species like ants, for example, that you could study. Um, one of the nice things about bees is it's hard to experimentally manipulate bees, whereas ants, you can make these like clonal colonies of ants and actually see how they change over time, whereas bees is just like, a mess in the hive and it's hard to track them. So that's one of the nice things about making a mathematical model of bees is that you can sort of um, understand better what's actually, or try to understand better what's happening in real hives. But I think that you could adapt it to other kinds of, uh, of insects because they do also have these distinct casts. And you could probably, I'm sure you could think about it as an energy problem as well. Um, but yeah, that's something that, that's, that will be the next animal, <laughs> an animal group that I study. Yeah. So in these simulations that you used to create the heat map, what was the, the loose carrying capacity value? Um, I'm I, just wondering like, how much higher it might have been than the scales. Yeah, so actually the, the carrying capacity, the loose carrying capacity was, uh, I said loose because a lot of times it just exceeds the carrying capacity, but not to like, you know, if you didn't put, originally we didn't put any on and you would just see, you know, the, you know, the <laughs> bees are, t took over the whole world. Um, and so we, we implemented this carrying capacity, but that's also interesting because it seems that there's sort of this, this threshold carrying capacity um, under which you just will not get anything and over which you'll always, you'll, you'll often be sort of around or above the carrying capacity, but not too much above it. I can't remember off the top of my head, I have it in the manuscript what the number was for this, um, but it was in the, the low tens of thousands. Um, and you could change that and it would just scale everything up or down. Um, but yeah, that's something that we, we talk about in the paper because it's kind of interesting to see what the, the end populations were given what we, what we made K. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, so I'm going to give you hopefully a bit of an overview of a project I've been working on for the last many years.
and highlight particularly some work that I did with some of my students over uh, the past summer or two, um, which has sort of been the most successful application, I think, of this particular method so far. Okay, so this is the outline. I'm gonna first introduce to you what neural codes are, why we call them neural codes. They're really very um, combinatorial objects, in fact, but they are coming from a problem in neuroscience. I'm going to introduce to you the algebraic method we're using, the tool that we have utilized, um, show you how we use that tool to get some partial answers in the topology realm and some more exciting answers in a construction realm, and then quickly at the end note one of our, uh, shall we say, open problems sounds much better than failures. So open problems. Okay, so why neural codes? So the original inspiration for this comes from a particular kind of neuron called a place cell, which was discovered back in the 70s. But these neurons code um, for spatial location, so the location that the animal happens to be in at the time. So this is like an overhead view of a region an animal might be exploring, and the sort of heat uh, map there is illustrating sort of the firing rate of a particular neuron. So. Um, there we go. So over in this region of the area, neuron one was very active. And so if you knew neuron one was firing, you could infer that this is where the animal was, and so on and so forth. So you can get from that these sort of pictures you're going to see a lot of today that kind of look like exciting Venn diagrams um, that illustrate um, which regions uh, you have for your neurons. And you could then look at the different patterns, the different um, different neurons that could be active in these different regions, and you could know sort of the different possibilities for where animal could be. So for example, here where the star is, you would expect to see neurons one and two both firing, and if you saw that, you would know that this is where the animal was. Sensible idea? Okay, lovely. So here it gets very combinatorial-ish. So if you had a lovely arrangement of the different regions, the different place fields, um, you would associate that to what we call a neural code. It's a very combinatorial object. Um, and this is just a listing of the different combinations you see in this arrangement. So here you see, for example, one combination we don't have is two and three only, the set two, three, because there's no place where two and three overlap where one is not also happening. So we would not expect to see that set here. So this is a neural code. OK, so the kind of questions we ask here are, which neural codes correspond to some arrangement of convex regions? Convexity here comes from a very common uh, assumption with these kind of cells, which is just to take their convex hull when you are working with them. So we are mostly interested in convex regions. Um, we have sometimes moved away from that, but we definitely want full dimensional of the space that they're in. Um, likewise, we often ask that they be open, but we have also done some work where they allow the sets to be closed as well, and that's fine too. Um, we want to know what the minimum dimension is in which you could build such an arrangement, and I'll explain on the next slide why that is an interesting question, since my motivating example was very two-dimensional. And then finally, if we knew there was a, an arrangement and we knew, say, it was two-dimensional, could we actually build it? And this is the question that my students were working on this past summer. These questions we've had partial answers to for quite a long time, but no one really bothered with this one. We were very, uh, I think, sort of stereotypically pure mathematicalizing it, where we were like, well, now that we know we can do it, we're not actually gonna. We never actually built the pictures. We're just like, it's possible, yay. But we never really bothered to see if you could actually build any kind of algorithm to create the picture, partly because that's a very hard thing to do in general, to make work. So I'm very excited that we finally have a way, at least sometimes, to make good pictures. Okay, so here is the examples that show why the dimension question might be interesting in a neural context, not just a mathematical context. They have recorded place cells in bats. Um, I'm very impressed by the, just the mechanics behind this experiment, the idea that you have to fit something to a bat that can record individual neurons and then let the bat fly around while you record. So they have recorded 3D versions of these. There is a one-dimensional analog that has to do with sort of the orientation of a stimulus that you might be seeing. So this is a visual example where you might see a bar at different angles. And in this case, sort of the, the neuron responds to a particular preferred range of angles, an interval. 
So it's a one-dimensional version of the same thing. So the question is still interesting in many other dimensions. OK, so what are algebraic methods? Well, for this, we go to um, a lovely ideal over F2. So we're only working in binary world here, since all of our neurons, either you're in the region or you're not in them. In this particular example, we don't allow for gradations in firing rate. Either the neuron is on or it's off in any of these. So we create the ideal where we look at the set of polynomials, and here's the number of neurons, that evaluate to zero on every single element in your code. Now, to say we're going to evaluate these, we need to convert our sets into things you could actually plug into a polynomial. And so we use um, basically the uh, sort of incidence vector where you say, OK, if I want the set 1, 3 out of 5 neurons, I'm just going to take 1, 0, 1 to indicate that 1 and 3 are on, convert it to a sort of binary vector. And then this is a thing I could plug in to a polynomial. So this is not an uncommon thing to do. If you've ever happened to have heard of the Stanley Reisner ideal, this is exactly the same kind of idea that we're doing here that they used for simplicial complexes. And I want to attribute that because that was the core inspiration for this particular way of encoding this information. So let me give you an example here. Here are two polynomials, and I'm looking at the same code word, the same set here. This one, since 1 and 3 are supposed to be both 1, if I plugged in to this polynomial, this would be a 1, but this would be a 0, so this would evaluate to 0. This could go into my ideal as far as I know, at least so far. Whereas this one, 1 and 3 would be 1s, and then 2 would be a 0 here, so that would also be a 1. And so this whole thing would evaluate to 1, and I could not put it into my ideal, just to give you a sense of what I'm doing. Sensible? Are you sure? <laughs> Questions? OK, we carry on. OK, so here is a list of some polynomials just to check. These would always show up in this ideal, regardless of what your actual code happened to be at the time, because I'm using binary vectors. And so if I plugged in anything where one of these, if this was a 1 or a 0, if it was a 0, this would evaluate to 0. And if it was a 1, this whole thing would turn out to be a 0. And then it would evaluate to 0. So these are always around. And I'm going to mostly ignore them algebraically. So here is a, just a general slide if you're very interested in the algebra for how we actually build this. I'm going to skim through this very quickly because we no longer actually use this method to build it. It's very clumsy. But just to show you here, there is a way to take your code and algorithmically go through and figure out exactly which polynomials you want in this list. What I want to talk to you about more is what those polynomials look like and what we can learn from them. So if you're into algebra algorithms, love to talk to you about this. It's not grobner basis It's something different. OK, so here's an example, which is, there it is, just to show you the kind of polynomials you get and how we interpret them. So a polynomial like this one says, OK, we need for every combination of regions, this thing has to be 0. So the thing that this is forbidding is that these three neurons are all firing simultaneously. You cannot have that, because then this would all be 1, and this would not evaluate to 0. So that tells us the regions for neuron 1, 3, and 5, they can't all intercept. There can be no place where they're all firing. And that gives us sort of a sense that 1 and 3 and 5 might be arranged like this. They can't all overlap. But because of the way we build this ideal by taking sort of minimal factors that we could possibly take, we know that, for example, 1 and 5 do overlap. Because if we didn't, if they didn't, we could have a simpler polynomial x1 times x5, a factor of this one, that we would use instead. So by making minimal choices, we actually know a little bit more than the fact that these three don't all overlap. And you can use uh, similar polynomials like these ones to get containment relationships that tell you, hey, wherever you put region 4, it's got to be contained in the union of 3 and 5. This is a fact that must be true about any picture you are going to build because all of your code words need to abide by that rule, and so must your picture abide by it. So this has been our sort of constant trick. We can take the code, we can push it through an algorithm, and we can get out a comprehensive list of all the intersection and containment information you need, in theory, to build a picture. The algorithm, that one, doesn't give you the picture. It doesn't tell you a picture is possible. It just says, here's the conditions. I have translated your list of sets into a list of intersection and containment relationships. Done. 
So our question was, now what can we learn from this? So you can use that in a topological sense, and there's a lot, I'm really comprising a lot of work here into one very short slide. But you can get a lot of topological information from these regions. So this, for example, that I showed you on the previous slide, tells you that, okay, these, all, um, these don't all intersect, but all the pairs do, and so some kind of blank space on the screen, <laughs> there will be a blank space in the middle of this arrangement. And so you have sort of a, um, a hole there that you could never realize in one dimension. This at least has to be in two dimensions. So you can get some basic topological dimensional bounds here. You can also find things inside of your code that simply cannot be if you really want to work with convex sets. So here's an example. Um, I've put a bunch of containment relationships here. I'm now imagining a sixth neuron that is not in my picture yet. And if I saw this kind of information, that would tell me that region one and three and five, they're all contained in this number six. So six has to contain that whole one, three, five arrangement. But then this last one says, but six has to be contained in the union of those three somehow, which in theory actually means that six has to be equal to the union of all three, if you want this all to be true at one time. But now we have a problem, because I've got this topological interestingness with a big hole in the middle, and now I'm saying I need there to be a sixth region that is the same thing as that little loop I've built there. So six would have to be something like this dark shadow that I've just interposed. I've made it a dark looming shadow because this is a problem. This is a big problem. If you want your region six to be convex, you cannot have a great big hole in the middle. That's a bad problem. So this allows us to also find obstructions to convexity to say, look, if you see a signature like this one in your algebra, don't even bother. This is not a convex code. Or maybe it tells you you're missing something in your data. There's a hole there. You have lost information or something because this isn't right. You need to correct. Okay, so there's a lot of work we've done on this. Mostly what this tells you is either occasionally guarantees that you're gonna be able to make a picture or often reasons why you can't. So this is very useful information, but it doesn't actually draw the picture. I'm actually cheating very much here because I drew the picture first and then did the algebra later. So I already knew a picture was possible, at least without that imaginary sixth neuron. So the question then is like, all right, well, can we ever build a picture, even if we didn't find any problems? And so this is the work my students had been working on. OK, so this takes us into a new realm where we talk about inductive piercings. So inductive here means the thing it normally means. We're going to build this up iteratively. Piercings has to do with how our regions interact with each other. So the informal definition here is that a code is considered inductively pierced if we can build it up inductively by doing these piercings. And piercings are a thing we like because in a sense we can build them up. I feel like the word I want to use is greedily. Like we can just put down the set wherever we want and we're never going to choose wrong. We're never going to have to worry about how it's going to relate to other sets that are going to show up later. Everything's solved for us. So, if we know our code happens to be this kind of inductively pierced code, then building a picture should be easy, or easy modulo the problems of programming. It's doable. We can tell a computer you need to put this in, and there will be no chance that there just isn't a place to put it. OK, so let me show you what some piercings are. Let me illustrate for you. A zero piercing here is basically you want to put down a set that doesn't cross any boundaries. So there's a zero piercing. There's a zero piercing. You're popping it into basically an open region and just sticking it down. A one piercing then, similarly, you want it just to cross one border. So you can place it in such a way that it intersects generally with one other neuron. And two piercing, similarly, gets a little harder to take this up higher, but you can put a two piercing in anywhere that it can intersect completely generally with two existing neurons. Now, those neurons do have to already intersect each other, or it is not considered a good two piercing. You kind of need to get the full Venn diagram, the full complement of sets, wherever you're putting in these piercings. And you can generalize this idea higher up 
Um, so this little dotted line one would not be considered a good two piercing because we're missing, we've only sort of got three regions here, not the four we expect to see. So it's not just about the number of borders, it's also about creating all the possible options within those borders. And you can take this definition up to any K you like, it's just much harder to draw in 2D, so I did not. Sorry if my voice is shaking, I feel like I'm really, really cold in here. <laughs> okay, so we want to, here's the formal definition, by the way, I am not gonna read through this. You've seen pretty much a very clear idea of what a piercing is, or clear enough as I can do in this time. This will not particularly help, but it does, there is a formal definition. The key thing I want you to get from this is to say you have a piercing, you simply need to know which neuron is gonna be your piercing, who's piercing who. Which neurons are going to be pierced? So here, for example, neuron 7 is piercing neuron 4. And then in what realm is this piercing going to happen? So a piercing that happens, you know, sort of out here it might be considered differently from this zero piercing, which has to happen within number 3. It's sort of happening in a realm. It's not piercing neuron 3, but it's happening. This is all happening inside of region 3. So where is it happening and who is it happening to? Okay. So here are some piercings. Now the algebra comes back. And so what we have found with my students is that if you take a code and you push it through our algebraic algorithm, there are, is a quick and an easy signature to go through, discover that your code is inductively pierced, and give you the order in which you should draw it. So how do we do that? We start with our canonical form. In this case, you will notice here that every single one of these polynomials is degree two. This is a critical signature for this inductively pierced kind of code. You want everything you see to be degree two. Occasionally, if you occasionally have a degree one, this is a problem you can work around. Those usually mean kind of boring things and you can get rid of them. But degree three and higher, this will not work. It is not inductively pierced. And then you take this degree two information and you build a graph. And so you go through and you take all of your neurons as vertices in this graph. And then you basically put an edge between things if there's nothing involving them up here. So I would not have the edge 1, 5 because there is something here involving 1 and 5. I would not have the edge 1, 3 because there's something here involving 1 and 3. Every other edge is present. Ooh, so, ah. Here is the graph that would go with this particular canonical form. And the thing that we're going to look for is a graph that does not have any large cycles with no chords across them. We are looking for a chordal graph here, if you've ever heard of such a thing. So you build a graph from your canonical form. And actually, I mean, if you, if you don't care too much about seeing pretty pictures, you don't actually have to build the graph. You can look for this information in other ways. But you are looking for um, a graph that is sort of very densely connected in terms of not having big open cycles. And if you have that, your code is inductively pierced, and you can immediately read off um, some dimensional information. So I've highlighted here the important things. Your code is inductively pierced if your canonical form is degree 2, and your graph that you build is chordal. This condition, although important, actually is default satisfied almost always, and the very few times that it's not, you actually can usually build a code that still has an elegant picture, by sort of saying, oh, accidentally I made neuron one and three, they're actually the same neuron. Oops, that made my canonical form look weird, but that doesn't interfere with my ability to draw it, I'll just make them both the same shape. So, and then this maximum clique size condition is only telling you how big of a piercing you have to do. So if you have a very large clique size, you're just gonna have to do very high K piercings to make it work. So any code like this, there will be an order that you can draw your picture in greedily. How's my time? Two minutes? Okay, lovely. So um, what we're looking for in the graph is that it's chordal, which means every cycle of length greater than three has a chord, something that cuts across it. And so this graph on the left here is not chordal because I have a four cycle with no crossing um, line. This one on the right here is chordal because those, that big cycle has been cut into smaller cycles with a chord. And so you want to be careful. This graph down here, it almost looks, um, you should ignore these arrows, by the way. Those are illustrating the containment. They're not edges in the graph. It might look here like I do have a four cycle, but actually the cord has just been drawn kind of outside of it. It's still there. It's just not inside in the picture. But this is about the property of the graph, not about the way I have happened to draw it. Okay, 
And so we simply are looking here for an ordering on the vertices um, that you can, uh, that is what's called an elimination ordering for a chordal graph. There are well-studied algorithms to find these orderings and to check if your graph is chordal. So that's something we did not have to invent, fortunately. And then you just need your ordering to also respect these containments so that you're not trying to place something inside of a neuron that isn't yet drawn. So you're not trying to put neuron 6 inside of neuron 3 before you've even drawn neuron 3. That would be awkward and difficult. OK, so here I'm going to show you one of the orderings that would allow for this. You actually find these orderings by picking off, ooh, heck. sorry. You find these orderings by picking off vertices, by finding an elimination ordering, where you pick off vertices whose neighborhood is um, a clique, a full, complete graph. And then we build up the picture by putting them back in in the reverse order. So I pick off my vertices. I always pick off the ones, if I can, that are contained in other ones, pick them off first, get rid of them, pick them apart. And then when I actually go to build the picture, now this is the part where you will see, as I build, everything I add is going to be a piercing of what is already there. So just place it in, lovely zero piercing, lovely one piercing, lovely two piercing, two piercing again, two piercing inside of number one, zero piercing, two piercing, and one piercing. And typically, what we found in our examples is that there are usually a lot of different orders to pick from. You don't even have to pick a particularly good one. There's usually many, many, not a unique order at all. OK, um, the final thing that we did characterize, just because I think this is a nice additional uh, feature, is that not only do we know how to detect these inductively pierced codes, how to draw their pictures, how to find the orderings, and it's all algorithmically lovely and computable, we can also characterize dimension. As long as we're using open balls, circles, we can characterize dimension pretty well. So basically, you're looking for a fairly complicated condition on ordering. What I'm going to show you is why that condition is important. So you might hope that if you're just going to be doing two piercings, you can do as many of those as you like in two dimensions. That would be very pleasing mathematically, but it's not true. So here I have two neurons, and I'm going to do a two piercing. There, I put it down there. Now I've done another one. I'm going to put it up there. And now I'm suddenly out of spots. I'm kind of out of places to make that full, beautiful Venn diagram happen. I can't do any more in two dimensions. So this condition that is kind of long and complicated basically says, when are you going to be able to do all of your two piercings in 2D? And when are you going to need to go up to 3D to do as many two piercings as you need? So here is the lovely flow chart my students made. Um, Anzai on the left is not my student, or at least he was once upon a time, but now he's a proper uh, postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. And then Ryan and Kathy are recent Colby graduates. And they created this flow chart. And so for their sake, I have left my own font choice behind and included the flow chart verbatim for their sake. And so this is what you do. You take your code words, compute your, your canonical form, check the degree condition. If it's satisfied, make the graph. If it's chordal, go ahead and you know it's inductively pierced, and then you can check the dimension elsewise. OK, so um, I won't go into this because I know we're out of time. Basically, this is one of our not complete things. We now have good ways to use the algebra to build pictures, but of course, there's a lot going on that isn't just topology and isn't just inductively pierced. There are ways your code can be sort of um, not convexly drawable that are not topological. You have to bend the sets in weird ways. This strays really far beyond biology, though. So this is an interesting question to me, how you could see any of this algebraically. But I don't think biologically, as far as I know so far, it is an interesting question. So thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the organizers for setting up this session. I'm happy to be here. Um, so as stated, I'm from University of Pittsburgh, and I'm working in Chung Chung Wong's lab, so we'll be discussing our current research that's happening. So I want to build some motivation, just in case you're not quite as familiar with neuroscience, because this is a biologically heavy um, model. So. In general, we, our brain is made up of excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, where excitatory neurons are responsible for transferring synaptic information across different brain regions, and inhibitory neurons are responsible for modulating that activity. Now, that can come out in terms of synaptic gain or response tuning. Um, there's a wide variety of how interneurons can actually modulate that information.
the three non-overlapping sets, but there are more that I'll be discussing, but these are kind of the most prominent at the moment, moment with biology, are parvalbumin, somatostatin, and vasointestinal, vasoactive intestinal peptides. So we'll be discussing those as well as an excitatory cell. So it's pretty well recognized that in a balanced, healthy brain state, which again, Across literature, this can kind of depend whether that's an oscillatory dynamic or an asynchronous dynamic. For our particular research, we're gonna be considering asynchronous activity as a healthy brain state. But in general, brain regions are typically made up of 20% inhibitory neurons and approximately, that's a pretty, uh, sorry, the laser's a little weak, approximately 80% excitatory neurons. So for me, this sort of begs the natural question of if we have quite a few different inhibitory neurons, yet they make up a pretty low number within any particular brain region, what would be the evolutionary advantage for having so many different types of inhibitory neurons and yet only pretty much one homogeneous population of excitatory? So to me, that tells, uh, that sort of indicates that these neurons, the inhibitory ones, must be highly specialized in what they do in each region. So for this talk, um, I'm gonna provide some biological background which motivates our model. I'll then discuss our particular model and the simulations that we conduct. We'll define three uh, dynamical states that we see consistent across our network. And then we'll also provide some conclusions about um, those dynamics. So over here on this diagram, we're gonna be building up this model circuit based on the biological literature. So before we start building that circuit, I just wanna provide some intuition about each cell type, um, the inhibitory cell types. So PV is a pretty prominent inhibitory neuron. It's very densely populated in any particular region and is highly connected to E neurons, as well as it exhibits some self inhibition on itself, which is kind of an interesting property. Somatostatin, does not have quite as many um, neurons in all brain regions, though again, depends on which cortex you're looking at. And they seem to have more long range synaptic uh, connections rather than these short distance ones like PV. The VIP is a pretty surface level inhibitory neuron and it's our least populous neuron within any cortex and it seems to strongly inhibit somatostatin's response. So from previous research in a well-studied EI network, so just a two homogeneous population, each population being homogeneous, um, there's a well-understood fact that the recurrent inhibition on inhibitory neurons actually stabilizes the network. And we can see this with the surrounding pathway exciting are E and I cells, where we see a reduction in both the firing rates of the um, E neurons and the I neurons with uh, inhibition on the inhibitory neuron. Excitation of um, the network actually ends up destabilizing it, and so we're gonna leverage this property of the recurrent inhibition to our network. If we continue with somatostatin, Within the V1, it's seen that somatostatin seems to influence the cortical oscillations when introduced with visual stimuli. And so what we see is if with, through optogenetic inhibition with a light uh, inhibiting a fluorescent neuron, we see that there's a major reduction in the peak frequency power of the oscillations and the neural activity um, with somatostatin, but this is not observed with the parvalbumin. So this indicates to us that the somatostatin must be responsible for these particular gamma oscillations when shown in a visual stimulus. Now VIP has a little bit more, I don't know, finesse or something. It's a little bit more tricky because it seems to robustly inhibit somatostatin. It doesn't necessarily have this like very obvious profile of what its activity will do on the network. And what they've actually found is that the VIP has different responses across different visual stimuli, which seem to indicate that it has some feature of controlling the somatostatin, again, indicative of the research that VIP does robustly inhibit somatostatin.
So for our project, we are going to present a network model that is biologically relevant, as I've just introduced a lot of biology. Um, we're then going to take each population, so we have our four populations, and apply the same static input um, to a single population at a time. We're then going to observe those network dynamics, see what happens, and hopefully get some intuition about what each uh, population and their synaptic inputs are responsible in regulating this network. And again, so the overall question is sort of what is each inhibitory population's uh, role in a network of a healthy brain? So you may or may not be quite familiar with um, the mathematical neuroscience models, and there are quite a few of modeling uh, neurons. For our particular network, we're going to consider an exponential integrate and fire neuron. So every single neuron in general from a population of alpha, if we look at neuron J that exists in that population, is going to be written as this differential equation where the dv dt is what we're solving for, cm is our membrane capacitance, we have our conductance, a reset parameter, a uh, slope factor, which helps us to tune how the sharpness of the spike is going to look and relate to the bio biology that we see on these spiking profiles. Um, and we have a external current, I, um, I alpha J, which is going to be our synaptic input that I'll discuss in a little bit. If we look at the total input, so again, that I alpha J, we see that it's a sum of all the connected uh, synapses to that particular neuron. So J with a uh, superscript of a capital F is a feed forward input coming from like a higher order layer. And this is important for us such that we can have noise and randomness within our simulation, as well as introducing the physical feature that our brain regions are connected and not necessarily isolated to one particular cortex, um, but receiving information from a wide range. Then we have the sum of um, all the recurrent connectivity such that that model circuit that I had presented, um, it's the sum of all those connections coming into that neuron and we're going to um, sum that to be the total of the input for that connection. This mu alpha is external input and this is where we'll be applying our static input here. Um, the, it's well known that uh, for spiking profiles, we can sort of do a modified like heavy side function or, or something along those lines to basically have a yes or no firing profile. And so here we have a postsynaptic input uh, written as this eta term. Our network then is, um, simulates 50,000 neurons and the neurons are broken into the four different populations. So again, sort of maintaining that consensus of the 80-20 split of um, excitatory inhibitory. Uh, we assume that 40,000 of these neurons are E cells and the other 10 are the inhibitory. Now the inhibitory neurons I've broken up into particular ratios and these particular ratios are chosen from the cortices that our collaborating lab records in. So from the AC and PPC cortex, we see that there are some differences in whether PV or somatostatin are kind of the dominating, you know, most popular neuron, but it's not drastically that different. And so on initial sort of probings, we had switched, which if there were more PV and more somatostatin, and it didn't seem to come out to be too drastically different. So we just decided to make them equal um, just as a choice. Our model is also kind of unique in the sense that commonly uh, spiking models are one dimensional and one time dimension where you end up with some disordered connectivity and you don't really know how one particular neuron's firing is impacting and you know, flowing down that connection circuit and impacting another neuron's spiking. So how we set up our model is to have a two dimensional space where every single neuron is initialized with a random position in our field of view. And then over time, because of that synaptic profile of having two dimensions and one time dimension, we can actually see how the firing changes over time and where physically those neurons exist in that cortex.
The other thing that's biologically relevant for our model is that we impose the, a, a decay in synaptic connectivity such that the further away you are from a neuron, you are less likely to be connected to them. And that's just physically relevant for the PV neurons, which have more short range connections. We can have obviously a larger decrease in their, um, their inability to connect with further range neurons and somatostatin will exhibit longer range connections. We also have noise and randomness introduced into our system where we have probabilistic connectivity just in general. Um, so even though it's highly likely that you know, PV will um, connect to a particular East neuron, it's not always guaranteed. We also introduce a feed forward Poisson point process to our excitatory and PV neurons, and that is a range of, of around 10 hertz. And the voltage membranes of all of our neurons are randomly initialized within a particular profile. So our simulation is this, which I've kind of alluded to a little bit. We're gonna choose one population. So we'll just call this alpha. And we're gonna apply discrete constant static input at every time step to that particular population, just that one. Now that range of, of uh, input is going to be minus one to one. And that's a, you know just chosen based off the firing, uh, or excuse me, uh, that range is chosen based on the amount of input current required for each neuron population to actually fire, where it only, you know, for somatostatin, for example, it only takes about 0.6 current to actually fire an individual neuron. So this seems relevant for where our particular model lies. Um, we're then gonna allow that synaptic input to, you know, discreetly increase, and we'll allow the other parameters in our model to remain unchanged. And what we end up seeing is that when we take any one of the populations and apply static input, we see three consistent activity states. So we have the sub-circuit state, a weak synchrony state, and a strong synchrony state. So we're gonna go over those definitions. So for the sub-circuit state, our network effectively behaves like an EI population network, where we first saw in the first biological background piece, where uh, somatostatin and VIP are very low firing and don't really seem to impact our network, and E and PV have very normal firing profiles and remain very asynchronous. There's no real pattern within those raster plots um, presented there. Now let's see if my, oh yeah, nice, okay. So what we're seeing here is actually a, a simulation of our firing activity. As I had said, we have that, those two spatial dimensions so we can physically see which neurons are clicking on at the moment. So the smallest dots are our E neurons, they're the very small black, like single point neurons. The blue are PV, SOM is in yellow, and VIP is in purple. Um, and I'll play that one more time. As you notice, there's not a ton of SOM and VIP. This particular animation, um, and actually the animations going forward, are within the same time window of the raster plots that I had displayed prior as well. So this seems consistent with what we had seen in the raster plot, that it seems pretty asynchronous, no particular firing um, pattern. Now our weak synchrony state immediately sort of changes those dynamics, where we have more uh, activity and pretty normal activity for somatostatin and VIP, and they seem to fire in a very organized way. Now there do seem to exist some ranges, some bands of asynchronous activity, but when there are heavy, um, heavy amounts of somatostatin and VIP that are organized, we see that this starts to influence the pattern of our VIP and, uh, or, sorry, our E and PV neurons. So again, we can kind of see this happen where when we see a large range of inhibition from a SOM and VIP, they seem to locally inhibit what is happening there, but not too organized. Um, there still is quite a bit of asynchronous activity, so that particular larger wave was definitely those hard bands that I had pointed out of the somatostatin and VIP. But with the Poisson input, we're able to sort of continue our network and have some asynchron asynchrony. Our last state is the strong, strongly synchronous state, which I'm sure that you had some intuition based on our weak state. 
where the firing pattern is very organized. And this is pretty much due to the fact that E and PV come online, they end up recruiting a high number of somatostatin and VIP neurons, which lead to a large wave of inhibition and then silencing the rest of the network. Now, if we did not have the Poisson process as a higher order input, our network would stop firing, right? There would be no excitatory input coming into the current, and so this is necessary for us. So in a sim simulation, we see large waves of inhibition just wiping out the absolute network, and this sort of behavior continues to go forward. So all three of these states are robustly expressed when we apply static input to each population individually, which is kind of an interesting feature. So what this ends up uh, what we end up seeing is that across the different states, how we apply static input seems to lead us to those different state activities, where if we activate so, uh, E or SOM, we see that with more positive, and when I say activate, I'm going from a negative static input to an excitatory static input, which is indicative of a positive one. Um, we see that the firing rates of the cells continue to increase, and the maximum coherence, which is indicative of the amount of synchrony that we have in our network, uh, reaches a plateau, actually, in this particular case. Our input to somatostatin holds a similar profile, but remember, we do have differences amongst our connectivity that can sort of explain these changes. But somatostatin ends up... I've lost this. Somatostatin ends up having a very large amount of excitation, dominating the entire space, and then leading to a large amount of coherence, which is sort of indicative of that strong synchrony state where we see those neurons just all firing together. Because of that amount of inhibition, they're all kind of locked into that cycle. Now with uh, PV and VIP, even though we also see those um, those dynamical states consistently, the way that we actually yield those is a little bit different. So by inactivating PV or VIP, we actually destabilize the network, right? So if we activate um, v, uh, PV or VIP, we end up with a pretty normal um, activity. But in the case of in activating it with a negative static input, we see a high range of um, maximum coherence. VIP is funky and doesn't look quite as consistent as the pattern that we would like, but we have to remember sort of about the connectivity that we have on our model circuit. And our VIP actually has no inhibition going to our E cells and only strongly inhibits our somatostatin. And so because of this change, VIP ends up kind of acting like a sole player in some ways. And so that can explain where the difference across that profile exists. So when um, looking at our different states, if plotting the maximum coherence of our E population, which we specifically highlight just because in our biological collaborating lab, E neurons are definitely the most common that you end up recording, though our lab has done a really good job of um, cross-tagging multiple types of inhibitory neurons, but most commonly in the biological papers, they're reporting on E neurons. And so we can see these different types of profiles when relating them to the firing activity, where we seem to have different trajectories where the E, oh, excuse me, the E and the PV seem to lead to similar states, but the somatostatin and VIP act to input seem to follow a different type of branch activity, which makes us want to go into now an analytical formation of a mean field model or a firing rate model to physically analyze these dynamics and what particular states are, they exist. So um, in conclusion, what we end up seeing is that the SOM and VIP end up increasing the coherence quite rapidly, a little bit more quickly than E and VIP. They're a little bit more um, uh, like stepped up with this synaptic input, or static input, excuse me. And we can explain sort of those differences, as I said, with like the VIP not necessarily following our profile like we would like, um, through the different connections that we have in our physical uh, network.
From our preliminary work, we are working on the bifurcation analysis of these particular states with looking at a mean field model um, to robustly and theoretically explain these states. We've also been able to apply different types of input, not just static at every time step, but a heterogeneous static such that it you know, has a wider range of um, input, you know, so a particular neuron population wouldn't necessarily be all receiving a minus one static input, but some distribution that is a little bit noisy. We've also had a Poisson uh, distributed input and a profile of ramping up the input within time. And we still see a lot of these dynamics to be consistent across those types of input. So it seems to be a feature of the connection, not necessarily just the input type that you're putting into the network. So with that, I'd like to thank my PI, Chung Chung Wong at University of Pittsburgh, as well as our um, collaborator, John Rubin. Um, we have an absolute uh, monster of a grad student. She is just excellent digging song at Carnegie Mellon that we also work with. And um, I would like to thank our experimental collaborating lab, who is uh, Caroline Runyon is the PI, and the Runyon Lab at uh, Pittsburgh, which they've done a great job of doing multi-tagging of these different inhibitory neurons, which is definitely very cool to see. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, so, um, so let me first clarify one thing that I should have mentioned. Um, milliseconds instead of seconds, this is the fourth four seconds that we're seeing for uh, up to five seconds, and we run our simulation for 15 seconds, which is typically longer than some of the recording profiles that we get. So in this particular case, because they're discrete values, um, we actually see at the particular input type, the strong synchrony come on immediately. Now, if we look across the different static input types, right, where it actually is discreetly increasing, we do see that change uh, very sort of gently come on, right? So we have the range of static input here, but if we isolate a particular input type, we'll end up in that state profile automatically. Um, but when we combine them across those discrete values is when we see that gradual change. And that'll be really the parameter that we're concerned with in terms of the analysis for sort of what state we exist in. So for the first like four seconds, right, the time starts at zero, like what's, what's going on there? Any kind of like? So we cut out, like, we cut out um, uh, 250, um, 0.25, or no, 250 milliseconds, such that we don't have that ramp up, um, because we don't necessarily want to include that, because your, your system has to come online and just sort of get everybody. But yes, we exclude that in terms of our calculations. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, thanks, appreciate it.